I was just tuning in to a debate from MythCon, Sargon of Akkad versus Richard Carrier. Overall, um, you know, they had some interesting moments in it, but overall I'd say that it was rather a bit of a flop. The reason I found out about it was, you know, there were so many things in my suggested news feed on YouTube that were saying that Sargon of Akkad failed in a bit in a debate or something, so I was like, all right, well, I guess I have to watch that once you see like six other people talking about it or something of that nature. I'm recording this now in November, but this was back in October of 2018, so it's about a month old, but not the um, oldest thing in the world, still somewhat fresh in terms of the internet's age. Well, you know, this one started out with Sar Sargon of, the, of Akkad came out of the gate swinging, I mean, or maybe we can just call him Carl now, Carl Benjamin or whatever, I don't know. Not sure what to call address him as anymore, but, but um, whatever. I digress, you know. So he came out of the gate really with a lot of energy, but about 45 minutes into the thing, he kind of crashed and burned, and he just sort of... He hit a very low point in this debate, and um, it was some place that, you know, something that Richard Carrier didn't really have anything to say about because both of these guys just sort of realized that they weren't talking about, you know, anything at all. It's, you know, I believe their challenge was something like, should um the should social justice or something be applied to atheism? And they just both agreed, you know, that not in the radical kind of SJW, the social justice warrior that you see on a college campus mentality. No, it should not. <laughs> but, um, and that was just the end of it. So they, they recognized that they all agreed on the same thing. But when they tried to talk about stuff, it was like Sargon of Akkad more wanted to come at things from, like, a larger level and just look at everything from a fundamental issue, whereas Richard Carrier wanted to be like, okay, let's look at how this applies to something like abortion. Let's look at how this applies to something like gay marriage, and then we can, you know, kind of use these examples, and let's see if this question applies to these examples, and then we can, you know, see if this works out or not. But overall, um, I would say that... I don't know, they really missed the mark on a few things. There are a few things that I would like to note about Sargon of Akkad's performance that I thought he actually did better um, than people were giving him credit for, but I'll save that for just a little bit later. So we're going to be talking about one, one, one larger thing, though, where I think he did wrong. Overall, I'd say Sargon of Akkad's kind of understanding of the law was not you know, the absolute best, because he brought up the example, you know, of something like abortion, and I'm talking about Sargon here. Like, he was saying that, you know, if you wanted to pass legislation for women's health, you know, such as, you know, stuff related to abortion and be, even just calling that women's health, well, what about women that do not support that? What about women who think abortion is just something that violates, you know, fundamental human nature that is just a complete abomination. What about women that don't want that? I mean, is that for them? No. So when you're trying to do these things that are trying to benefit a particular social group just because you think that it's right or you think that it's in their name, it's not. You're discriminating against the other parts of the social group that are not included in that. Abortion is a very clear example. And on the surface, that sounds like, you know, something that, you know, is an absolute... That's an absolutely profound statement, right? Wrong, actually, because, you know, there's a very simple thing. There's a very simple thing that just goes on. The law, regardless if you're pro-life or pro-choice for everybody, the law is not about consensus. It's not about agreement for every single person. There's a very famous quote that um, laws are not fair, they are written. You know, and that's just, I mean, think the thing that was missing from his sort of understanding where it's like the law isn't meant, you know, to be a perfect fit like a fits like a glove thing for everybody. No, he even talks about the concept of, you know, politics. You have this opinion, you have that opinion, you have this belief, you have that belief, you argue it and you talk about it and this comes out as the end result. All right, well, the same thing happened with abortion, except it wasn't, you know, through the through the legislative branch, it was through the judicial branch, but it's like law is not a consensus. It's not supposed to be something where everybody is in agreement or in everything. Even if you're pushing legislation for women, that doesn't have to apply to all women. I mean, like, that's just kind of like, you know, once again, I think they touched on this in the debate as well. They're really playing the semantics game. But in reality, this is also something such as they are focusing in too much on the terminology because, you know, like, it's just the law is something that, you know, is just argued, it is presented, 
legislation is passed and it doesn't have to meet this definition that Sargon of Akkad was talking about, you know. Just, so just to say that something like abortion, you know, is kind of discriminating against the other parts of the female population that don't want it, well, you know, that's kind of beside the point. I mean, that's definitely not, well, that's not the intention of what a law is supposed to be. So once again, I, I would question his kind of understanding of that definition. The area where I thought, though, that he did very well was actually something um, really close to the end, you know, it's like, at first I, I was even kind of thinking that he went a little bit too far. I guess I have another criticism thing to say first that'll tie into something, but it's like, he was sort of saying, you know, that um, people should not be interfering with social issues except at the voting place slash the ballot box. I think the ballot box was the exact word that he used. So it sort of means like, you have the right to vote, you have the right to argue, you have the right to talk about politics, but don't be interfering with issues. But, you know, he really clarified that at the end of it. It might have even been during the Q&A session when he was talking about how, yeah, you can put up posters. That's fine. You can, you know, even do something like protest. That's fine. But when you start violating someone else's rights, that is not fine. And I think that's sort of like the kind of diagnosis that he gives to a lot of these things that are going on in America and England, of course, as the result of, you know, social justice warriors, that they are, you know, like that they are violating other people's rights with things like deplatforming or not letting people come on to certain campuses, saying that they don't have the right to do that. Well, I mean, the biggest issue that we have with deplatforming is I don't really know of many places that where this happens on a public level. For example, we have things like, you know, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, all that stuff, those things are privately owned, right? Well, those are just businesses making their own decisions, which is what everybody wanted to do anyway. I mean, they have the right to do all that stuff, so I don't really know what... I don't, I'm not really sure why he's choosing that example. I mean, you might disagree with their choices, you know, that someone's being punished for expressing a particular viewpoint, but I believe the whole thing was, you know... The whole reason why people started protesting this stuff is because they want businesses to do whatever they want. I mean, why is it, you know, that one side is so up in arms when, you know, a um, bakery refuses to make a wedding cake or something? And they're like, hey, those guys should be able to make any business decision they want. However, when it comes to something like someone gets kicked off YouTube or kicked off Twitter for violating their policy, then you're just like, oh, those guys were wrong. They should not have kicked them off for making whatever decision they wanted. You know, it's just like, that's a big um, kind of contradiction that I would see in something like the uh, platform of Sargon of Akkad. But overall, though, I would say that I saw at his best moment was just talking about the entire concept of power dynamic, because I think that's kind of the thing he wanted to get through to Richard Carrier, but, you know, like, they just were doing a lot of back and forth. What I think he's trying to say is that, you know, what, what social justice warriors have evolved into who is something that does not care about the issues, that does not care about what's going on. They simply only are viewing this as a power dynamic. They're people that are saying that they hate men, that they hate white people, and they're simply just trying to kind of say those things, and they're trying to go after certain people by violating their rights, and they want to do that purely as a form of power, of a power dynamic. You could call, you could equate it to power tripping. So, so social justice warriors are just more of a power trip, you know, and like even the concept of the people that just stand in front of gates and don't let people in, uh, just sort of a form of arbitrary power tripping. I would think, I'd say that I, th I would think that that's Sargon of Akkad's best, um, some of his, that was his best moment. Now, overall, though, Richard Carrier uh, brought up a few interesting things. He tried to say that Richard, so he tried to say that bad actors always exist in any group, no matter what it is, and that includes people who promote social justice. What Richard Carrier was really trying to instill in Sargon of Akkad is that social justice is something that is much larger than just people protesting on college campuses and people talking on the internet. He was like, those people don't even have any real voice. Sargon of Akkad is like, why don't they come out and debate? And Richard Carrier is just sort of like, well, I mean, that's just so few people in existence, not to mention the people who are actually doing the protests on college campuses are not famous. I mean, they aren't even, you know, they aren't even 
well known in the slightest bit. You know, maybe people can say Triglypuff, but I don't know her real name. No one actually does. No one will probably ever know. But, you know, it's like, I think really think that's what he was trying to say is just this actually represents a much smaller portion of humanity than Sargon thinks they do. And furthermore, what um, Richard Carrier was trying to say was there are a lot of social justice causes where people are like, you know, trying to bring education to Africa, trying to bring sanitary napkins to India, just like, you know, trying to get rid of things like FGM, you know, female genital mutilation. That stuff is social justice. But it's like what we really have to sort of recognize is that these guys are kind of caught in this bizarre system where... Um, they both had different definitions that they wanted to talk about. They both had, you know, um, kind of different things that they wanted to say, but they didn't really want to fight on the, during this, on the same points, you know, and it's just like... Also, a very big point that Richard Carrier put forward, though, we talked about the things like Africa and India, right? Well, what he's actually saying is that is not only part of the um, social justice warriors. That's the majority of social justice. It has nothing to do with the Internet or college campuses. The majority of social justice is actually done offline, and Sargon of Akkad was completely ignoring all of that. I'd say, though, that Richard Carrier made kind of an error when he sort of really underestimated just how large the concept of, you know, hatred against white people and hatred against men is because, you know, it's like, yeah, there are a lot of people that really do want open discrimination against those two social groups. So for the sole fact that, you know, they can really get away with it. And like we sort of live in this world where it's acceptable to discriminate against the political majority for some unknown reason which is a very, very um, kind of unfortunate and bizarre cultural phenomenon. I mean, I don't really know. I mean, like, I really think that um, there, I mean, I, you and I both know that there are people out there that hate white people, and there are people out there that think men, you know, control the world, and that's bad, and that, you know, men are just this destructive gender and stuff like that. And, you know, I mean, th those, I don't mean on the internet. I mean, like, having those, you know, conversations in our personal lives. You know, some people, you know, once they get a little bit, you know, out of their zone, they just start rambling on about that stuff, and that is a very, very real thing, and I think Richard Carrier underestimated that people do actually have that feeling. But, you know, overall, is is social justice a toxic ideology? Well, I mean, it sounds kind of weird. I was almost leaning a little bit toward Richard Carrier's m m movement when he's like, well, Richard Carrier's idea, rather, not a movement, but an idea that these are, there are people in the world who are actually just, you know, trying to improve the overall quality of life for just humanity, and that's kind of what they attribute to social justice, and what Sargon of Akkad is opposed to is just, you know, a very, very minute and minuscule aspect of it, and I mean, like, the majority of social justice is not committed, is not performed online. Yeah, I think so. I mean, like, it definitely should be anyway, and also, um, I would say, though, that Sargon of Akkad also had a very interesting thing when he talked about kind of, um, oh, well, I believe it was a viewpoint from France, did he say, where they had, you know, this concept of the world being very dark and, you know, oppressive and evil and bad, and then once you got through that dark layer, there was just this um, god that was very loving and um, all contained all things good, and that was how intersectional feminists viewed the concept of man, that man was just sort of um, this dark, oppressive force that was, you know, in the way of, in the way of, you know, women achieving things like, you know, love and glory and all of these wonderful things. And, you know, it's like, is that true? Um, overall, probably to a certain extent. I mean, I really do think that Carrier underestimates how many people in the world actually think like that. I think it's much larger than he anticipates. I don't think it's a majority at all. And, I don't think a majority of women think that way, or even a majority of, you know, college students or college professors would view men as just this evil barrier in the way of, you know, human progress. It's more just like that's what happened over the course of our human history, and that's how we got to where we are today. You know, for if you're listening to this corner of YouTube, I'm sure you know just as well a variety of factors have made the world the way it is today. You know, you can choose whatever discipline you want, and you can examine it in that particular way. But um, I wish they kind of, you know, had chosen a different topic. And, oh, the, I'm not sure the name of the moderator in that debate, but at any time he could have just thrown a different 
challenge question at them because it really just seemed like they wanted to debate something and their debate just ran out of fuel it was like they wanted to um you know really have a challenging either a conversation or a flat out debate that they were opposed to but they just didn't have the substance material to go at they didn't have anything to really you know expand upon because they just kept getting kind of bogged down and i really think though that sargon of akkad was trying to convey to him what we talked about with power dynamics like he's like you're just sort of overlooking the fact that this is just an, they're trying to use like the intersectional nature of this sjw movement to to create an arbitrary form of power tripping or at the very least they might honestly believe that they are doing the right thing by violating someone else's rights and on that note, let's talk a little bit about hate speech. I mean, I did an upload um, as sort of a response to Stephen Crowder's hate speech isn't real, changed my mind. And we brought up, you know, the concept of, you know, how you can hate something. I, I just really thought, you know, hate speech was any form of speech that contained hatred. If you had asked me six months ago, what's hate speech? I would say it's any form of speech that contains hatred. I hate the Philadelphia Eagles. I hate chicken on pizza. I mean, I hate those things. Is that not hate speech? I mean, why would you ever say that it doesn't exist? And even if you're going to be saying that, you know, there are things like, you know, you hate a certain social group, that would also be hate speech. And we brought up, you know, David Knight's famous statement, hate speech is to the first as the AR-15 to the, is to the second. Does it exist? Well, yes, of course. It's very, very real. But the question is, should there be a law that would prevent it, you know, from being suitable for, to the general public or abused in the general public should we actually have a hate speech law and i think that's what people are kind of um trying to deal with now elizabeth warren was talking about this in the in the senate about one year ago more or less about trying to say something if i can remember her exact words it's been a while but she said something to the effect of she thought there should be hate speech laws because hate speech serves as an existential threat to certain communities, equating that with, you know, threats of immediate violence. If I recall her words correctly, it was a really long time ago when I heard that. But that's kind of the way that we are, that we are living now. Is that a real issue that we're dealing with? Is that something that's actually going on? Is that, you know, something that could be a reality in America? If they were to do something like ban the N-word or ban the Nazi salute, what would happen? I mean, like, really, what would happen? And I'm not really sure. I think a lot of people would be up and outraged. But what I would say as well is that um, I don't think it would impede intellectual discussions. I don't think it would impede communication in any way. And a lot of people are just more likely afraid that that that's going to lead to larger bans on hate speech in the future. Now, Sargon of Akkad brings up the biggest thing that he wants to talk about, the First Amendment. America has this great First Amendment, right? Well, not exactly, because... Everything in the Bill of Rights is evolving based on Supreme Court cases that go back, you know, 200 years, like, to a, more than 200 years, really. Everything in the Bill of Rights is completely evolving, and the First Amendment is very difficult. And not to mention, you know, with the Second Amendment, we talk about this very openly. We, we had United States versus Miller, 1939. We had United States versus Heller, 2008 or whenever it was. And we sort of say that, yeah, this definition is something that has evolved and it changes over time. The same thing is true with the First Amendment and everything in the Bill of Rights. So just to say that we do we really have freedom of speech in America? Well, once again, we've talked about this before on this channel, but um, just to sort of reiterate, there are all sorts of limitations and there are all sorts of, you know, I guess you'd call them just reasonable limits associated with freedom of speech. I mean, you're not allowed to... You're not allowed to say the famous one, fire in a crowded theater. But what about things like blackmail and perjury? Those are also illegal. You're not to be allowed to use your speech for immediate violence. That's also illegal. You're not even allowed to call a business and, you know, do a prank that intentionally causes them to lose money. That is not protected in many states. There are just countless examples of, you know, ways that speech can be, you know, restricted and this way that speech, you know, can affect things. Furthermore, what happens if you were ever to become racist in the active sense? If you Are you allowed to tell somebody, get out of my store, you're black? No, you're not, because it violates the 1964 Civil Rights Act. You know, it's like, all the, the law is very tricky, and that's why people have to go to law school, and we can't just sort of say that freedom of speech exists, and people like Sargon of Akkad and Stephen Crowder grossly met, rep, misrepresent this. They always just want to bring up fire in a crowded theater, but they never want to talk about any of the other examples about how reasonable limits have been placed on freedom of speech. And even if you don't think they're reasonable, legal limitations have been placed 
on freedom of speech. So I think, once again, Sargon of Akkad's understanding of the law and how the law functions is off, and I don't think that his understanding of the legal system in America is correct. So I don't know, and that's not his intention. It's not his intention to um, do anything of that nature. What Sargon of Akkad's intention is, I guess, to sort of just represent something that is anti-SJW because his followers seem to want to hear it, regardless of whether or not it's true, you know, because, well, let's face it, this is a product of the Internet era. So I think that really kind of came out in his debate with Richard Carrier, and he's just sort of like, hey, I'm not an angry SJW, and then he's like, oh, crap, what do I do now? All right, well, that's my little rant and rave about um, the debate between Sargon of Akkad and Richard Carrier. If you have anything to say at all, um, please uh, drop a comment below, and if you want to challenge anything that I have said, go for it.